Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to our discussion on the stimulus packages and how they impact small businesses. I really appreciate you coming today and for showing up on time. I hope everyone's families are healthy and safe. I'm Amy Belay. I'm the Vice President of Contractor Success at Pearl Certification and board member of the Building Performance Association. And I'm pleased to be hosting this webinar in partnership with the Building Performance Association. Both organizations are passionate about providing valuable insights and information to help you weather this crisis and thrive on the other side of it. A couple of housekeeping items. Everyone is muted given the number of attendees. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function that you can find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I'll be managing the questions and Kara will answer as many as she can at the end of her presentation. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link with you as soon as we're able to. You are welcome to use the chat box throughout. I may not be watching it as closely as the Q&A, but will do my best. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Kara Sol Rinaldi. Kara represents both organizations and has supported contractors for many years through her work with Efficiency First and some previous iterations of the Building Performance Association. Uh, she's been involved with supporting in the contracting industry since the days of Homestar in, in 2009, and she's been on the Hill supporting the contracting industry ever since. With that, Kara, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for having me today. I'm uh, proud to, to represent both uh, the Building Performance Association and Pearl in Washington, D.C., and the Andal Policy Group it, um, has always enjoyed working with the contractors, whether at the state level, with the regulators, or in Washington. Um, so, so this is me. I, uh, I, one thing you will see from my bio is that I spent a lot of time in Washington working on energy efficiency. What I, um, one thing to note is that um, I am not is a, I am not an accountant or a tax advisor. So, uh, the reason why we're having this, um, the, having this entire presentation today, is because we know that people are confused about the um, about the COVID responses with the stimulus from Congress, and we've been watching it very, very closely, and we continue to advocate in uh, Washington because uh, Congress is not done supporting this industry. That said. I, I want to make sure that everyone knows that I'm going to be telling you the congressional intent that I understand from staff, um, so how the legislation reads. Um, I will not be providing tax or accounting advice. I'm going to be giving you the, the best knowledge that we have. And please note, all of these bills didn't even exist three weeks ago. Uh, it usually takes years to pass pieces of legislation, and these are passed quite quickly. So um, the tax advisors and, and accountants are still trying, and bankers, and even the government themselves are still trying to make sense of it. So um, I, I hope this is helpful for you as, um, as we walk through, and I'll answer what questions I can, but please do seek uh, tax and accounting advice um, should you want to make decisions for your business. So Pearl, uh, uh, so Pearl certification, many of you who are members, uh, Pearl uh, certification documents efficiency in solar installations to provide investment grade documentation, which helps home, uh, home, uh, homes appraise for more. Um, and Pearl contractors uh, do these installations across the country. And I will say one of the wonderful things about uh, Pearl is that um, the homes are appraising for more, they are selling for more, and they are helping uh, uh, contractors contractors sell, uh, sell these and realtors sell these homes and upgrade these homes. Um, the Building Performance Association is a member driven 501c6. Uh, we actually have 10,000 members um, and, and it, we're dedicated to advancing the home and building performance industry. So that's from everything from energy efficiency, health, safety, environmental performance. Um, we do this through advocacy, education. Many of you have attended our conferences and read our publications. 
So the agenda today is that uh, I'm going to go over the congressional response to COVID-19. I'm going to, uh, I will talk about the summary of the stimulus one through three, and what, and again, these are these are stimulus bills that aren't focused on energy at all. They're focused on getting money out the door um, into people's hands to address the fact that this this country is in an unprecedented pandemic. Um, I will then give, give a bit more of a deep dive into the SBA loans and what we currently understand of legislative intent. Um, now, these are temporary programs, a number of them are, um, and, some are and some are supporting existing uh, programs, but these are specifically targeted for those who are, are hurt by the COVID-19 impact. I'm also going to be focusing on small businesses, um, and, and that my understanding is that most of those on the phone will be small businesses are working with the small business community. Also, uh, future stimulus bills and kind of what our current expectations. Uh, it is a bit of a moving, a moving situation here in Washington. And so we are, we are continuing, continuing to follow this, uh, the situation. Um, and then hope for homes, a stimulus proposal. If you end up jumping off this, uh, um, this webinar early, please be sure to go to the building performance website and uh, uh, on the front page, there is a take action and sign up, sign to support Hope for Homes. I'll be de describing it near the end of, a, of the agenda, but that is a um, stimulus legislation to provide immediate support for the home performance contracting community for the, for the, uh, for the entire residential contracting community, as well as to provide important rebates um, strong, uh, strong, and, um, and re rebates for homeowners um, to support the contracting community and the manufacturing community that makes energy efficiency. So please do sign on to that, um, so we can make sure that we share that with the Hill. So jumping right in, the congressional COVID response. There were three emergency COVID relief packages um, so far. And I say so far because we do have every expectation that there will be more. Um, the phase one, which is the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act was signed into law on March 6th. Uh, then the phase two, uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act was signed into law on uh, March 8th, uh, March 18th, excuse me. And then phase three, the CARES Act, which, which I'll be spending a, a fair amount of time on today, is the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. And um, that was signed into law March 17th. So again, that's March 17th. So that so we are still um, deciphering that piece of legislation. Um, and uh, we even today have learned more from the, Dep from the Department of Treasury. So the first three packages have focused on mitigation and immediate relief, and none have included provisions on clean energy. So we are we're hopeful that with all the conversations about infrastructure and the need to to really focus on re-stimulating the economy and a um, and investing in infrastructure that will help uh, provide also for a, a clean energy future. We are hopeful that there will be um, additional relief in additional stimulus packages for this industry. So this is what a, a great quote from President Obama when talking about the stimulus. You know, what do you think a stimulus is? It's spending. That's the whole point. Uh, and it is spending. Uh, this is primarily spending. It's uh, it's providing money without strings attached as, uh, for the most part. Now, um, some, of the, some of the bills, Stimulus 1, um, had, was a, had a few less strings in the sense that it was an $8.3 billion emergency supplemental funding, and, um, and it was a response to COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, for small businesses, it immediately sent a, a fair amount of, of money to the Small Business uh, Administration. Um, for economic injury, injury disaster loans, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, the majority of funding, though, was for health and human services, um, including the public health and social services uh, emergency fund, CDC, NIH, FDA, um, and to support um, R&D and vaccines. So there was a lot here that was primarily focused on making sure there was, while there was money certainly provided to SBA, the, the focus of, of phase one, the first stimulus, was on uh, working on getting vaccines for COVID-19. Then phase two 
the Families First Coronavirus Response Act um, includes several provisions um, uh, affecting small businesses. Uh, and, and I want to know, when I talk about small businesses here, I'm generally referring to the small business definition of up to 500 employees. Um, and now businesses, now meant, uh, one thing to note is there are exemptions for uh, those companies that have fewer than 50 employees. They can provide for certain exemptions that have to do with paid, paid sick leave, um, and as well as uh, refundable tax credits, expanded unemployment insurance. These are all elements that were a part of the uh, phase two. Uh, so these are pieces to be, um, that I wanna be clear about. The small business exemption, uh, uh, the small business exemptions, all conditions must apply um, uh, and they can, and leave is, it can be requested because of a, a child school or, or place in care, or a, a child school or somebody is in, uh, or daycare is closed or um, uh, somebody is- Tara, we're losing your home. audio a little bit. Oh. You're, you're back on now, but you cut out just for a moment. If you could just back up. Uh, a, a couple of points on this slide. Okay, I'm, I apologize. Uh, and we are, I think also one of the things I've noticed about Zoom meetings is there's a lot of people on Zoom these days. Uh, sometimes that may be creating a bit of a, a bit of a noise or lack thereof, so I apologize. Um, one, so one thing just to be clear is that these provisions are for um, this, that if you are a business that's smaller than 50 employees, some of the requirements to ensure uh, paid uh, for paid leave and sick leave are ones that um, may be exempted from your company. And I have so many slides and this gets very dense that I do, I am gonna move relatively quickly over some of these provisions. So um, we will get back to them. Um, on phase three, uh, the coronavirus aid uh, a relief and economic security cares act so this is um, one of the biggest parts uh, for small business in the cares act is the small business loans i'll go over these in more detail momentarily in the deep dive that i mentioned but overarching there's a two trillion it was a two trillion dollar stimulus package uh, there are direct cash payments to americans aid to state and local governments dramatically boost investment in the health system, expand unemployment insurance, and provisions for small businesses. So the small business loans primarily focus on three different uh, uh, buckets. That's the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, some people are saying PPP, P3. It's, a, it's $349 billion. And these are new federally guaranteed forgivable loans. Now, there are reasons for those forgivable loans and we'll, um, that we'll talk through in a minute. Economic Injury Disaster Loans, that was $10 billion, $10 billion. That was the first to appear on the SBA website. So if you had immediately gone onto the SBA website and were looking, you might've seen these loans and thought they were the, the P3 loans, but they, are, they were um, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. If they, uh, those had existed before, but they were expanded for COVID-19 and impacted businesses. Then there was debt relief. Um, that's a $17 billion program to cover six months of loan payments for small businesses with existing non-disaster SBA loans. So that if you had a, if you had an SBA loan or you had a loan that um, that you had already applied for and then it, happened, and then it has come through now, uh, you have a, a period of time um, for debt relief. So the business tax provisions included the employee retention tax credit, um, as well as delay of payment for employer payroll taxes. So let me talk through these a little bit first, because there are a number of business tax provisions. That there, so there are a number, but just to note, there are a number of tax provisions. These are two that, um, that are specifically impactful to small businesses. So that's why I'm talking about those. If you're a business that's larger than 500 um, employees, uh, there are likely more for you. Uh, the employment uh, tax credit um, uh, is available 
is available by quarter. The exclusions are that the credit is available to all employers regardless of size, including tax exempt organizations, but employers who take uh, the, the PPP loans are not eligible even if they do not receive forgiveness. So eligible employees are those that carry on a trade or a business during the calendar year 2020, including a tax exempt organization. So, um, and, I, and there are, are different qualifications for tax exempt organizations. I'm not gonna go through those in too much detail here. But um, one thing to note is qualified wages, which is a key piece, are wages paid after March 12th, 2020, and before January 1st, 2021. So, this is the period of time when when the government and the determined was it was going to, the COVID-19 crisis was going to be most impactful for businesses. Uh, for employers with more than 100 employees in 2019, only wages paid to employees uh, not providing services uh, due to COVID-19 or, or that are furloughed. So this is there are issues related to the furloughed employees at furloughed businesses and one of the key quest one of the key issues to note is that when uh there are two different ways of comparing your wages uh, and this is something you should talk with your accountant about which is whether or not you you would be comparing the wages you have and the number of employees you have this year or during the same period of in last year there are there's more than one um, way to determine your wages so that's something to um, to pay attention to and, and talk to an advisor about. Um, the mid-sized uh, business loan program—that's the loan, that's the low-interest loans to mid-sized eligible businesses and nonprofits. Those are between 500 and 10,000 employees. Uh, they also have. Um, low interest loans, 2% uh, max interest rate, in fact, and six months of deferral payments. Um, so there are additional details that are forthcoming about that. In fact, some of them were discussed today um, by the Secretary of the Treasury, and there are, we will be hearing more over the coming days, I'm sure, um, specifically about that. Um, when claiming these, uh, these tax credits, um, they will be there. There's a, um, there's a report on the quarterly federal tax return, um, and they can also uh, we, you can also request an advance of the credit from the IRS. So rather than going, I, we will be posting some additional information um, on the BPA website, and I want, I want to be sure that you all have an opportunity to see that as well. Um, so the update today, to be clear for mid-sized businesses, is that the Secretary of the Treasury said that they're aiming to release details this week. They're also going to be renaming it, it sounds like, to the Main Street Lending Program. It's unclear the financial hardship documentation that's going to be needed. And that's another point um, I would uh, recommend that if you are uh, considering taking one of these loans, that you, that you are sure to keep very good records of all of the of all of your of the hardships that your business is, is receiving because it's unclear right now what kind of documentation you're going to need so best to just keep it all now we're going to go into the deep dive and i know this has been pretty pretty uh, dense already so we'll see how we'll see how this goes um, i'm going to be talking again just about the sba loans for covid 19 related programs and the cares act so the Paycheck Protection Program, that's the P3 loans I talked about earlier. Again, so the $349 billion program. Uh, now, it, Congress may increase this soon. One we've heard as early as tomorrow, in fact. But one of the big concerns that we have and that Congress has is how to act when they're not in session. So I'm just going to take a pause here just to remind everyone that Congress does is essentially acting under a lot of rules that still exist from the 1700s. Um, how they're going to pass laws without being present is something that is still being discussed among leadership. So uh, it, they can't necessarily just all jump on a Zoom call and take a vote. So how they're going to make that happen is something that, that the parliamentarians and a lot of legal advisors are in, in the process of trying to determine. But what the, has seemed clear from leadership on both sides of the aisle is that they recognize that 
this program, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, as well as some of the other um, hardship programs uh, are running out of money quickly. And therefore we need to, they need to act soon to support um, the, the country and the businesses that are feeling that economic hardship. So the loan amount for, for um, the P3 loan is 250% of the average monthly payroll. Uh, so with a maximum cost of $10 million. Uh, up, up to 100% of the loan can be forgiven if you keep the employees in the payroll. So the forgiveness amount is equal to the sum spent on payroll, um, rent, utilities, or interest on mortgage um, payments over an eight-week period. Now, 75% of the loan should be on payroll, or it must be on payroll, according to what we understand now. Again, a lot of these rules are still being um, uh, made clarified, and, made more, and uh, some additional details may be with your bank. For any amount not forgiven, there's a 1% interest rate over two years with the first payment deferred for six months. So there's still a preferential um, interest rate that's being provided. And the loan available is retroactive to February 15th through June 30th. So, but then there's that first come first serve piece. And again, Congress is looking to act soon, as soon as they can, because uh, this there have there is an expectation already that there will be far more requests for support than they are able to um, than they're able to fulfill um, let me think what else I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure I've, I've covered everything you need oh well one thing I was thinking is uh, to give an example um, so an example of a P of a p3 loan because it was pretty it's pretty dense information so here's here's how I was uh, I see it so let's Say you're, you're Joe and you run Joe's contracting. Joe has five full-time employees and has all year long, so since the beginning of 2020. Each makes approximately $2,000, and that's the payroll cost for each of, each of his employees, um, and that which means he's got $10,000 a month in, in payroll costs. Now, Joe lays off three employees due to COVID and, and the fact that a lot of the programs that he works with are shutting down. He's an energy efficiency contractor. They are laid off for a month, let's say from March 15th to April 15th. So during the height of this issue, uh, this reduces his cost by $6,000 because he, there are three employees he laid off. He hopes that they're, he hopes they're collecting unemployment. In fact, my understanding is many contractors have laid off their um, employees because they can't pay them, so they'd like them to get the unemployment that's available. Joe can theoretically take out 25K, again, that's payroll, P3 loan to rehire those employees. He, ha um, he, has a, he would have the same average monthly number of employees June 30th as he had January 1st, um, and Joe needs needs to know that there was a COVID hardship, which wouldn't be hard because this is the reason why he made that layoff. Joe still has no has has little to no work for these contractors, so he uses the two hundred the twenty five k loan for payroll, um, and uh, he asks for full forgiveness of the loan because he used twenty k for the eight weeks of payroll, more than the seventy five percent required, and the rest towards office rent utilities during the same period so that's sort of what that that's sort of a, a the, the concept that um the p3 loans were looking at so again a lot of things that to, to consider about what makes for an average full-time full um, ftes um all of those details we'll try and put some of those on our website but um and also, what is the check for what co what is COVID-related hardship? It's been unclear as to exactly what um, the specific requirements of the hardship is. So ap applicants simply currently have to certify that they have had an economic hardship. So um, and that they're being self-certified. But the lenders may provide up may have other. Um, may ask for other uh, uh, input from the borrowers because you will be going to your lender to get that to get those loans. 
So you find a, to find an eligible um, P3 lender near you, here is the website. Again, these will be on the, um, on the BPA website as well. Businesses and sole proprietors can apply now. Uh, now, another thing to note, 1099s and self-employed workers um, can start applying April 10th, and so they should apply for themselves. So if you have um, employees who are 1099s, they don't really count in your FTE bucket because they have their own um, hardship uh, uh, abilities. Uh, the SBA has set up their own pieces for them. So that's something to consider when you're talking to your employees and thinking about the different employees that you have. All right, now the economic injury disaster loans. Um, these are the emergency grants that were first popped up on the website and uh, on SBA and ones I got a lot of questions about immediately. And that's because they had, they have this, an immediate um, emergency advance of $10,000 that was supposed to be available within three days. Now, our understanding is that that, that there has been, there have been delays in that. Um, you've all heard it in the news. This isn't a surprise. Uh, you may have applied for one and haven't received it yet. The Treasury is working to try and speed up that process, is our understanding. Um, the EIDLs are low interest disaster loans of up to $2 million. So these have existed before. They've been expanded um, for um, during COVID. And, um, there's, and there are certain disqualifications and things that you should be looking at. But they have a, their interest rate is around 3.75. Um, and the, for nonprofits, it's lower. And there's a 30-year max term. The loans and emergency advances are, were, are made available from January 31st to December 31st of this year. Those who've already applied for these loans related to COVID are also eligible to receive the grant. So if you've already, if you had, a, if you had applied for it immediately because you knew it existed, um, at, even before the, the bill had passed, you were able to still um, be part of this, uh, of this bucket of loans. And you can see the website right there. And again, it's, gonna, it's on the BPA website um, and you'll see these slides later if you need them. SBA Express bridge loans and debt relief. So there are bridge loans. They, you must have a current relationship with, the, with an SBA Express lender to receive them. Uh, you can have, this is access to 25,000 while waiting for, um, for, the, for your, de your decision for the disbursement of the EIDL loans. So bridge loans will be repaid in full or in part by proceeds from the, um, from the EIDL loan. So again, maybe I forgot to mention that $10,000 that I was talking about here, um, this emergency advance um, does not need to be repaid. Um, it's a it essentially turns into a grant. Uh, now you have to apply under the certain circumstances and go through the process. Uh, the other thing to note is that if you did do take out this $10,000 loan, you can also take out the P3 loans, but that $10,000 is applies the overall forgiveness. So remember, let's go back to Joe. Joe took out $25,000 loan. Let's say he also got this $10,000 emergency advance. The understanding or the congressional intent, our understanding is, is that how that would work is that Joe basically got $35,000, but he would, he, but he really still, um, that $10,000 is, uh, is kind of taken out of the P3 and he only, he, he would still have to pay back $10,000. He only really gets forgiveness for that for $25,000. Um, but it could be, it, it's part of the P3 loan process, so therefore he's at the lower interest rate. So it would still be something that you should talk to an advisor about. And um, one thing, what did, before we go too much further, let me see if there was something else I was, um, all right. No, I did mention that. Uh, there are so many different pieces. I just want to be sure I get the, the high points for all of you. Um, so on to the debt relief. The debt relief portion is $17 billion. Um, that sounds like a lot, if you, we have, but we've just been talking about hundreds of billions. Um, so it covers all loan payments 
for non-disaster SBA loans for a six month period. And uh, relief is also available to new borrowers. So I really wanna mention that new borrowers piece is something you might wanna look into because the debt relief piece, these are, these are, low, these are SBA loans, so loans that you might have taken out anyway, your small business, you're taking out a small business loan from the Small Business Administration, that's actually available to take out a new loan now, today, and still potentially qualify for a six month period of debt relief. So again, there are circumstances that could apply to that and you should look in, you should uh, talk to your advisor about which is the best way to go. So recap, what loans, grants, credits can you take simultaneously? Now remember I said you can apply for the P3 and the EIDL loan. Remember Joe in my, it, um, did that. He, he, he did the 25K, and for, which it was 250% of his, um, his payroll for a month. And he also took the EIDL, which was that immediate influx of cash for 10K. Um, so you can apply for those to cover payroll. It just can't be the same exact thing. So you're not double dipping essentially. And if you receive the 10,000, um, that it has to be subtractive from your P3 loan forgiveness. That's, that's what, that's, um, how at least the legislative intent appears. Um, the EIDL loan received between January 31st and April 3rd can be refinanced into a P3 loan, um, making it eligible for forgiveness. So again, if you took it out early, you can still um, potentially dump it into the P3 loan bucket. Um, uh, oh, and you, if you, you cannot claim the employee retention tax credit um, uh, as part of the P3 loan. So if you are, if you are, for example, if you're um, taking out a P3 loan for payroll, you can't also claim a tax credit for the same payroll. So that there, there's a lot of pieces in here that are essentially double dipping. I think you all understand that, you know, they wanna just provide forgiveness once for the same uh, hardship that, um, that you're claiming. Um, and you can claim tax credits uh, for the required paid leave. Um, you can also claim tax credits for qualified paid, paid leave wages. So that's sick leave and, um, and employee retention tax credit, but just not the same wages. So again, that's just, you just want to make sure it's just not the exact same wages. Um, so yes, I've been reading this legislation. I know how to read legislation. And so this is my current understanding of how the, of, of how the, the federal government is, is addressing these, these uh, pieces of legislation. Tax advisors across the country, as well as accountants and banks, are trying to understand it right now and sending questions nonstop to the Small Business Association, which in turn is virtually daily updating their website. So this is a, this is a um, by the moment uh, situation that you're all in, um, that we're all in. There's a, um, we have, as I noted again, at the beginning of last month, there was no bill. Um, there was not, none of these uh, loans existed. So this is a very, very fast, this is much faster than the federal government is used to working. So I, um, I, I'm certainly not gonna ask anyone to have patience. So, but I am going to just note that the reality will be that some of these things will take some time and the Building Performance Association and Pearl Certification will be providing to their networks as much updates as we can to keep, because we're, um, we're allies in this and want to be as supportive as possible. So my overall suggestion is, that for, is to be sure to make sure you assess your situation before you go to your advisor or to your bank, assess your situation and what you really need. Is this a short-term issue? Um, will, once the pandemic's over, you're gonna be ready to get right back in the game. Um, does this impact your employees? Do you want, is it better to bring them back on and take them off unemployment? Um, consider what works for you and your business. And also is loan forgiveness the, the biggest requirement for you? Because if you wanna make sure that, that the loan is forgiven, that, that's gonna depend on the type and size of loan. So when you're going in to have those, that advice, think, think those things through in advance um, because it will change what kind of combination of loans you're gonna be looking at. And again, to note that these issues are still changing. So I may have said today that something can't be forgiven or would be forgiven. And they are still, again, this is a pot of money that is reducing fast and they're having to make some changes as we, as we go. 
Um, and but again, we'll be as supportive as possible as we as we go forward. Um, now, what to expect in the next stimulus bill? I think that's another big piece for everybody concerned because uh, none of this is going to be enough for the energy efficiency contracting industry. Uh, we are currently seeing um, utilities looking at their business model and seeing that they have reduced revenues and increased expenses while they're not allowed to shut, shut off uh, buildings that are out, outside of payment. Um, and yet many buildings are not burning energy that they were expecting them to. In fact, the grid where they may have had peaks before is, uh, is shifting around because people are at home and not net in, in businesses. So the utilities have a lot to think about and, and they may reevaluate their efficiency programs. That could change how things impact our industry. So with that, we are looking at what the next stimulus will look like. So first, we were thinking stimulus four was going to, was going to be where we we're gonna be addressing infrastructure. Um, uh, earlier this week, actually, maybe it's Friday, the um, well, Speaker Pelosi had started, started to speak about um, what stimulus four might look like. And, and whether or not um, it would just most likely be straight extensions of stimulus three. And that is because all of those loans that I just mentioned and I just walked through are running out of money and there are so, there's so much need still out there. So there's a potential for stimulus five, um, which would be a broader economic stimulus package. Uh, immediately, it would be immediately re relief coupled with long-term stimulus programs to restart the economy in various industries. So again, there's a there's a understanding across Congress that when we all emerge from the pandemic, which we will, there is going to be a an economy that needs a, a kickstart, and how that's going to look and what that legislation will look like has largely been discussed as being the ever elusive infrastructure package that frankly has been discussed for um, the last couple Congresses. So. Time remains uncertain. Additional funds for the, for the P3 and other programs could still happen as soon as this week, uh, as soon as tomorrow, and mul uh, multiple rounds are possible. But timing for the potential stimulus five is entirely dependent on when Congress gets back to DC. So again, one thing I mentioned was that, that Congress continues to work uh, under a pretty traditional um, standing in, on the floor of Congress taking votes. Um, those of you who visited Congress and hear the bells uh, or the buzzers on the clocks when members of Congress need to get to the floor in order to register their vote, it continues to, act, to work that way. There is proxy voting in the committee, but the concept of how they're going to do it on the floor of Congress, whether it's in the House or the Senate, is still unclear. The House and Senate are scheduled to come back to D.C. April 20th at the earliest. So that would be the earliest that one would expect them to be able to stand on the floor and vote on new measures. Uh, now that is entirely dependent on when the shelter in place orders and the um, and uh, social distancing requirements by the CDC are put in place. So we understand leadership is talking about this nonstop. Um, and, but one thing I can assure you is that the staff, the congressional staff are working right now on those broader package. Uh, what, would those, what would those broader packages look like? Um, infrastructure and resiliency investments for, our, for both for the, uh, for the entire uh, infrastructure of the country, not just the energy infrastructure. So roads and bridges could be on, in that as well as pipes and wires, as well as buildings, because buildings are a part of America's infrastructure. Uh, clean energy provisions and tax credits what would those look like? What are we looking at? A, a clean jobs workforce uh, provisions, um, and energy efficiency, home performance, clean energy stakeholders advocating for these provisions that support um, uh, the hurting workforce that we we all work on. Um, advancing America's home infrastructure is part of the economic stimulus. So in the past, homes have never been considered part of uh, of America's infrastructure in this in the same way as. Um, as roads and bridges, but the fact is, um, we, you know, utilities count on our homes to uh, both provide demand, um, both provide demand response, 
um, and to reduce energy consumption on demand, uh, and also to generate as we have seen more and more solar plant panels on roofs. So this is a, uh, the, the way in which um, homes are being gonna be viewed in this infrastructure bill, we hope will be very different than it might've been in um, throughout history. So, what do, so one thing Franklin Roosevelt said when addressing uh, the, the issues of the economy was we have always held to the hope, uh, the belief, the conviction that there's a better life and a better world beyond the horizon. So when we're all sitting here feeling, feeling that the pain of, of uh, this pandemic, that's something to think about. But also he said that when you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. And so that really is what hope for homes and the hope for home stimulus is. Both, uh, both the Building Performance Association and Pearl Certification have supported this legislation, as has ACCA, uh, the National Home Builders Association, um, so NHB, um, and AHRI, and uh, the Alliance of Save Energy, ACEEE, U.S. Green and Building Council, National Association of State Legislatures. There's a long list I have of uh, you for the future. There's a great long list of wonderful um, organizations and trade associations who signed on to um, Hope for Homes in the hope that we can stimulate the economy and bring um, contract the contracting workforce right back, not only to where it was before the pandemic, but even better and with, um, with a stronger workforce. So what does that mean? Well, the Homes Act I'll talk about in a minute. That's a bill that's been around for, for a while. It's been updated, but it's been around for a while. The, con the contractor, the HOPE piece is the Home Online Performance-Based Energy Efficiency Training. Remember how I mentioned all those bills that hadn't been around even three weeks ago? Well, this was developed three weeks ago. So what is, what is HOPE? It's a $5 million uh, bill to support online training and certification pathways for contractors. There are grants for contractor companies up to $5,000 to again help with the rehire and supporting online training of their workers. There's also a training stipend for up to $1,000 for competing these for completing HOPE qualification, which basically means taking a certain number of courses um, over the over the time that they're you know stuck in their homes, not able to go on to job sites, but able to get on a computer and able to learn. And $25,000 for provider organizations to offer free training so that those contractors can get on and and get. BPI accredited or take ACA training or take NAHB training or take any of the trainings that are out there that are going to help them be better at their job um, and be able to do deeper and broader retrofit. So that's hope. And then that would be coupled with home so that when those contractors who've just been trained go back and are able to go to the job sites, they, there will be a strong rebate program. No matter what happens to the utility programs that we're seeing right now, that they will that there will be a rebate program that they can utilize. There's a partial performance rebate program, which is essentially, if you're licensed and insured, you can participate in this. Um, it has to do with its air, its insulation, air sealing, plus HVAC replacement. There's a combination of incentives, and um, it's these are the more prescriptive options. So it's a list and uh, of the of options that you can take. Then there's the performance-based rebates. These are deeper retrofits for 20% to 40% reduction in total, in total energy use. If, you were for, if you're familiar with, it, with what Homestar was back in 2009, these are a little bit like Silver and Gold Star, but there's, there are some significant changes to, to update them to, to how the last 10 years we've learned a lot from the industry. For example, there's options for both modeled energy efficiency and measured energy efficiency or paid for performance. So join this letter, the letter on the building performance page. Please be sure to give us your name and, uh, and, and your, your address so that we, and, and we're using that so that when we go to the, go and talk to Congress, I say go to the Hill, but I am on Zoom calls with, them, with congressional offices every day. And when we're doing that, we're going to be sharing that your support with your members of Congress so that they will support this and know that we still need and the industry still needs um, uh, additional, additional advocacy and additional funding to get us back to where we were, or even better. So here's some additional resources. Uh, again, all of these will be on the website and uh, we'll be sending these along, um, as well as these. <laughs> I'm going a bit fast. I know you're not gonna be, be taking it down each one of these. Uh, again, we'll make sure you have them. So 
Uh, if you need more information, uh, I'm here, but also the Kitty with as the, the Building Performance Association, Amy with Pearl Certification, their contacts are there. My contact is right here. And thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And hopefully I have time for at least a few questions. Um, and I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. I think uh, really, sure. really appreciate that. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in. I'll just remind folks mm -hmm. to use the Q&A function and we'll get to as many of these as we can uh, in the time we have left. So the first question is, is can a W-2 employee file for loss of commissions? In other words, can a salesperson recover uh, commission lost? That is um, probably falls into one of those, uh, it's a very good question and one I would um, ask your advisor. I would I certainly say you should look into it because I, they are trying to take into account um, all of the uh, commission loss. Uh, it would just depend on which loan you were, you were applying for. So I would, um, I'm afraid I don't have a, a, a cut and dry answer to that, but it is definitely something, there are, 1099s can certainly claim um, a W-2 employee will just need to um, look through those additional pieces. And you may have to do it through your employer and that's what I don't know. Okay, great. Uh, the next one uh, is, is a clarifying question around uh, the payroll protection. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's retroactive to 215. Does that mean I can account for payroll from 215 to 315 and then payroll from 515 to 630 for forgiveness, assuming employees were furloughed from 315 to 515. Uh, I'm trying to, I was trying to write down that question fast enough to, under, yeah, to, think, to get all the numbers. I think the question is um, if you didn't actually furlough them until March, uh, but the protection is uh, at the beginning of, is part of February, can they apply for payroll protection starting from February, even though they didn't furlough until March? My understanding is that the um, they can apply as long as they they have um, they have the same number of employees at the beginning of the year as they um, as they have in at, on June thirtieth. So if in that period of time they were furloughed but they were rehired. That, um, that 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 they should absolutely apply and um, and put in those that time frame. The key issue is to make sure that you that you have that rehire because that's the um, that's really what the what the legislation was aiming to get at. Okay, thank you. The next one is with respect to the EIDL. Do small businesses have to apply for a loan with the banking institution separately from the P3 loan. Um, so do you, would, why would they, would they want to apply to them separately? You can apply for them separately, absolutely. In fact, they might expect you to have applied for them separately. Or is the question, could they apply for them uh, it, together? That might be implied. Um, that's, if, uh, if the person who typed that wanted to uh, further clarify, that would be great. It's an anonymous attendee. Um, but. Uh, can you apply jointly for both of them? Uh, I don't think you would be applying for them necessarily at the exact same time, but if your banking institution has that availability, then I don't, I, I certainly don't see why not. I would talk to your bank about that because since they, since, since you would be um, talking with your um, banking institution about them anyway, they would be the one to, uh, to advise okay. you. Um, and this is a, another question with respect to just uh, the structure of Congress these days. Do you think a clean energy stimulus could get passed given the Republican administration and Senate, in your opinion? In my opinion, yes. Right now, absolutely. I think that we've got it. I think we have a chance. If you asked me that question at the beginning of the year, I would have said no. But right now, um, the President Trump has already mentioned an infrastructure package. He's mentioned additional, an additional $2 trillion, uh, I think. Um, and we have seen um, the, that we are in an unprecedented time. Um, and I know in speaking with both Democrat and Republican staff, 
they are very concerned about the workforce and about how they're how they're going to be able to support uh, jobs and the job losses. The, the support for infrastructure is something. If those are remember back before the 2016 election, the infrastructure was seen to be the one thing that both both candidates agreed on that the the need to invest in America's infrastructure. But there has not been, and there are infrastructure bills that have been around over the last couple of Congresses um, that are pretty detailed from both sides of the aisle. So there is a, um, there's a desire to inv invest in infrastructure. There's a question as to what that looks like. And there has been redi re reticency to um, spend too much money. But in a stimulus situation, I think the, we're in it with a, just a, a whole other ball game. So um, I think that if a bill that would support America's workforce, um, and I think our contractor workforce is without a doubt bipartisan as well. This is not a partisan workforce. This is a bipartisan workforce um, of small businesses who um, who are uh, you know fighting every day to you know to go into people's homes and upgrade them. And so I think that we have a very good shot. As good a shot as, as anyone does. If there is a big infrastructure package, yes, I think we have a very good shot of getting in there. But I will caveat that, Amy, with we need to get the voices of the contractors um, to join us. Again, ACA, NAHB, Building Performance Association, we have a lot of workers amongst us. And uh, the more that uh, share their views and share their voices, um, the closer we'll get to getting to the president's desk with a bill. Great. And then um, I, I, this might be the final question. Again, if anybody else has questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. And the question is with respect to the timeline for passing Stimulus 4 and Stimulus 5. Uh, it's mm -hmm. dependent on Congress returning to work. Is, that, is the timing the same for 5 and 4, in, in, at least as far as you know? So here's the question. Um, Yesterday, uh, Majority Leader McConnell made reference to being able to um, add money via unanimous consent. So um, I don't know how they would do that, based on my understanding of how um, they can they can move legislation. But uh, the House was able to to move with by unanimous consent um, and. If there was a way of just perhaps just if it's a it's a it's a modification, perhaps there's a I don't want to call it a loophole. Perhaps there's just a a piece of parliamentary intelligence that was uncovered that would would allow them to do that. Um, then then I don't think they can do actual legislating though. So if so, what we're talking about the broader stimulus packages, the infrastructure packages, they require debate and thoughtful consideration. Um, an opportunity to to speak um, to to their colleagues on the floor um, of their chamber. That is done in person. So how they do that piece without being um, being able to be present in person, uh, that is that's a, that is what I think we're really hold, we're really held up. The just additional money. Um, I have not seen how the uh, the rule in which they're invoking, but uh, they're at least it appears that some of leadership thinks that they will be able to find a way to to do that. So um, it's possible that they can't, but if they can, I think that that's what they're they're aiming to do this week or, or early next. Okay, we did. so the timeline for, for the next piece will be um, hopefully as soon as I get back. Okay, we did have one more question come in. Um, it, it did pass infrastructure packages that have passed uh, have significant efficiency components to them? That's an interesting question because um, it depends on what, uh, it, de it depends on your definition of infrastructure, right? So um, the 2005 and 2007 energy bills um, could be considered energy infrastructure. They gave a great deal of um, of support for uh, for for changing um, standards and tax credits. 2005 um, it is where 
a lot number of the energy tax credits that we, that we know about today, whether it's 25C, 45L, 179D, that's um, respectively existing new and commercial buildings, um, existing homes, new homes and commercial buildings. Uh, those those all came out of 20 of uh, out of the 2005 energy bill now it wasn't really referred to as an infrastructure bill it was referred to as a um, comprehensive energy bill but uh in, a, in addition to expanding federal federal energy management programs and other um and and, and you know other energy pieces it um it it could have been considered infrastructure uh the last era legislation that um, that also included a lot of the smart meters around this country came from um, from funding for advanced metering infrastructure, uh, and that came through the last uh, round of ERA funds, um, you know, um, a decade ago during the recession. So these are so it depends on your definition of infrastructure, but they absolutely do it would include energy. I will say this, Amy, is that and to to the person who requested. When we talk about infrastructure on the hill, energy often comes up. I mean, it's usually, you know, along the, the first uh, items that are discussed. Um, and so, and I know that the states also have encouraged energy infrastructure support. Um, so I think that I would, I would be surprised um, if the country would move an infrastructure bill that did not touch on the energy sector. Okay, thank you, Kara. I think that is the last of our questions. So I'll just wrap up by saying thank you so much, Kara, to you and your team for pulling this together and sifting through it to make it make some sense to the rest of us and uh, looking forward to uh, offering up more things like this to, uh, to our networks. Um, just a reminder to folks, this was recorded. We will share it. Uh, as soon as we're able to, and apologies to those folks who weren't able to get on, uh, we will make sure you get copies of the slides as well. Thank you all. Stay safe out there. Thank you.